Howdy folks. So today's video is going to be about resistors and power amplifiers. So I have a resistor here. Uh, this is a little quarter watt through hole resistor, but uh, these are kind of boring. I think everyone's seen these at some point. No, today is going to be about much, much bigger resistors. In fact, this big. So these resistors, which uh, recently uh, came in the mail, um, these are 8 ohm, 100 watt wire wound ceramic tube resistors. Um, these are a really, really useful tool to own. And uh, I want to go over how you can use these uh, in a variety of applications and why this type of resistor is uh, is what I generally prefer over uh, another type of resistor. Um, and I'll start with that. These, of course, are more, ex these are kind of a, an expensive type uh, of resistor. They're a ceramic tube. In this case, there's just a, a threaded rod that goes through them with some uh, metal angle brackets uh, so that you can, of course, mount this to something. Uh, and it's basically just a, uh, a strip, a metal strip that's wound around this um, with two terminals. And uh, these are supposedly marketed as non-inductive, um, but of course they have some inductance. It's just not terribly high. The uh, the sort of the the more common type of big power resistors for you know hundreds of watts um, are resistors that look like this. Um, this one is not rated for 100 watts. Uh, I'm actually not sure what this one's rated for because it doesn't have any markings on it, um, strangely enough. But I, I suspect this is probably 25 watts, is my, my best guess. And these are readily available. They're very cheap. Um, and the idea, of course, is they're just a, an aluminum extrusion. And they have a core with some wire that's wrapped around there and the two terminals on the end. And the idea is that you can bolt this. You're supposed to bolt this to a heat sink. In order to get the heat out, because of course these resistors, there, I mean, they they basically dissipate 100% of the energy uh, as heat, so they get very very hot. And uh, of course these resistors are generally very small. This is 25 watts. The 100 watt would be nowhere near the size of this, so they generally re rely on something else to dissipate the heat into. And that's one of the reasons why I generally don't like these resistors for test purposes. Um, these, of course, are cheaper than these, but you've got to factor in the cost of whatever you're bolting them to. Um, so if you don't have a big heatsink laying around, um, then their cost is a little bit higher. The big reason why I don't like these uh, is due to their overload characteristics. These resistors here, uh, like I said, these particular ones are rated for 100 watts, and they can sustain an overload of uh, up to 10 times their rated value for up to five seconds. So that means I can put a thousand watts into this resistor for up to five seconds before it will probably start to burn. Um, which is pretty good. Uh, I, I, would, I, never, I would never put that much power through this, of course. That's an absolute maximum rating. But, um, you know, if I was testing something that, you know, needed 200 or 300 watts, I could briefly use this for that purpose, and I'd be okay with it as long as it has, you know, a fan maybe on it, uh, you know, adequate ventilation for that short duration, high power um, burst. Of course, it's a burst that we're talking about. You can't run this for an extended period of time at anything over 100 watts. Um, but these things, uh, of course, they have an overload rating as well. But the th the, w the thing with these is, uh, I've seen this happen um, due to the way that these are built. Um, they sometimes, when you overload them, uh, they will actually, they're kind of like kind of like a spring and they'll actually blow out on the ends. And uh, you can actually see this one's kind of loose. It's just a, it actually spins inside of its housing. This is really not a very well-made resistor, but um, what'll happen is it'll, it'll, it'll blow out on the ends and the wire generally won't break. So you'll actually have um, this, just this thin wire that's just, you know, several feet in either directions from this metal casing which of course can touch stuff, which is really bad, because of course it's still connected in circuit, right? And you don't know how high voltage that might be, and it can be dangerous, and yeah, these are, I, I don't like these types of resistors unless they're really, really well made, and by that point they cost more than the cheap ceramic ones. Um, like I bought this from China on eBay, 
Um, these kinds of resistors are kind of ghetto if you buy them on eBay. There are good ones out there, but there's also bad ones. So yeah, I guess take take it for granted, you know, whatever. So um, why, 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 why would I buy these? I guess that's the, the, uh, the big question. And of course, if you've read the title of the video, you probably know the answer to that. And that is, I want to uh, use these to test um, audio amplifiers. And if you're going to be servicing audio amplifiers or um, just, yeah, I mean, if, if you're servicing it or if you want to verify that an amp you have is, is, is healthy, um, is working correctly, um, this is not a bad way to test it. So the way that these resistors uh, are going to get used is they're going to be basically dummy loads for um, power amplifiers. So most power amplifiers have a nominal output impedance of 8 ohms. And thus, these are 8 ohm uh, resistors. Now, of course, these are um, purely uh, resistive elements. So they are 8 ohms, um, whereas a speaker has an impedance of 8 ohms, but its resistance is not 8 ohms. It's less than that. Um, but a power amplifier generally won't care. Um, so if it's rated for 8 ohms uh, speaker load, 8 ohm resistor is fine. 16 ohm speaker, 16 ohm resistor, it's fine. 4 ohm speaker, 4 ohm resistor, fine. And the reason why I bought two of these, um, because of course you'd say, well, couldn't you just test one channel with one resistor and then another channel with another resistor? And you could do that with, or with the same resistor again. You could do that. There's, there's nothing wrong with doing that, except um, when you have two resistors, uh, for the added cost of that second resistor, you get a hell of a lot more capabilities in testing. The first one, of course, is you get a much more realistic power output value because most audio amplifiers use linear power supplies, which means they're pretty much unregulated. So the actual supply voltage is going to vary depending on the current being pulled from the transformer. And as a result, if you test one channel at a time, you may get a higher power than if you test both channels at the same time. So having two resistors allows you to do that and you get a much more accurate power figure. Uh, because of course, you know, it may say it's 80 watts per channel and you might get higher than that when you do one channel at a time, but if you do both at once, then you may get, you know, even maybe maybe less than the rated spec. And that's sort of what this, these tests are for, is they're to, to test how close to the actual rated spec your amp is, or if you have an amp that you don't know what it's rated for, um, is to find out. The other reason why um, I bought two of these is because when you have two, you can support a lot more uh, speaker impedances. So if you have just one resistor, you can do uh, basically 8 ohm and 8 ohm only. But if you have two, you can put them in parallel uh, and then you can test 4 ohm amplifiers. So things like car amplifiers, for example, a lot of those are four ohm because the uh, voltage headroom is quite limited. Or you can put the, you can put them in series, and you can test sixteen ohm, um, uh, uh, sixteen ohm amplifiers as well. So, uh, of course, in those situations, you're limited to single channel only. But uh, it's a hell of a lot better than not than you know not being able to test them at all. So uh, I generally find that for the cost of you know one resistor, it's worth it. So I picked these up off eBay um, in Canadian dollars. They were, I think I paid $40 for the pair, including uh, expedited shipping. So they're not terribly expensive, especially when you consider that these type of resistors, um, you know, if you were to buy them off like DigiKey or Element 14 or whatever, um, they're, you know, 30 something dollars. And these kinds of ceramic resistors can be even even like upwards of seventy dollars or so from uh, North American suppliers, and the quality of these. Um, if you're thinking of getting them off eBay, um, I don't remember the seller that I bought these from. And generally speaking, uh, if I post the seller, then they're just going to jack the price up, and it's not going to matter that much. You can just Google for the or uh, you can just search for these. It doesn't really uh, matter where you buy them from. They seem to be sort of a generic type of resistor. But I got to say, the quality of these is actually. Is actually quite good. Um, they're all they're all of course coated in in something. I'm not entirely sure what this is, but it's obviously it's obviously dipped or painted on because it's kind of running there. 
But uh, yeah, they, they feel very substantial. Uh, the ceramic isn't cracked in any place, it, it, and they they really can dissipate uh, 100 watts. Uh, I've run these at 100 watts for quite a while with no no con nothing other than natural convection, and they seem to be perfectly happy with that. So before I actually go into how to uh, do the testing, um, I want to go over what equipment you're going to need and uh, what you're actually going to be measuring. So the, there are two ways of really doing this. The, the first way, the, the proper way, um, is to have an oscilloscope and something that can output a uh, basically a constant frequency, constant amplitude tone. So if you have a function generator, then that's great. Use that, Sell it, set, set it to you know, one kilohertz sine wave, you're great. If you don't have one of those, um, and I suspect a lot of people probably won't, that's fine because all you need is something that can produce that. So uh, I'm assuming everyone has an MP3 player or a cell phone or something um, that has a, a headphone jack on it. All you gotta do is just you know get Audacity or some PC software, generate the tone, save it as a, a file, uh, like a wave or a flack or something. It, you know, you could probably use an MP3. It probably wouldn't cause that much distortion at a constant frequency. And then uh, feed it uh, feed it out into your amplifier, and that's the input side. The output side, of course, you just connect your uh, your speaker wire directly to this. And then you have a choice of either using an oscilloscope or a multimeter. Now, an oscilloscope is the correct way, and it's really the only way that you're going to be able to get a, like, a really accurate power measurement. Because what you're going to look for is you're going to look for clipping uh, on the waveform. And that's going to tell you where the, the basically the amplifier has saturated on its power supply rails. And you can then use the voltage across this resistor, which you can measure, of course, with, with your oscilloscope. Uh, and you can measure that voltage. You can calculate the RMS voltage. And then you can substitute that into a very, very, very simple equation, which is just uh, P equals V squared over R. So the power is the uh, RMS voltage, which you're measuring across these resistors, divided by the resistance of the resistors. And of course, to get the resistance, uh, you're going to need a multimeter. Um, so, I mean, yes, they're 8 ohms, but the thing is, of course, they're 8 ohms plus or minus. In this case, these are plus or minus 5% tolerance, or so they say. So let's see what they actually are. There we go. 8.2, I'm going to call that 8.2 ohms. Okay. So you would measure, um, you'd measure both of these, and you would get their exact resistances as best as your equipment um, can do, and use that in the calculations rather than the nominal eight, because of course that's going to give you a much more accurate power figure um, at the end of the calculation. So today's uh, test subject or test victim uh, is this uh, JVC. What is it? An RX five fifteen V. This is a supposedly 80 watt per channel um, surround sound uh, audio amplifier. Uh, this thing is from 1993, four or five, one of those three years, I'm not quite sure. It's a great amp, um, but uh, it's kind of just sitting in storage anyway. I have so many amplifiers. So this thing is just um, sort of, uh, I'm just using it because it's uh, easy, it's not plugged into anything at the moment. So we're going to be testing this, um, and I've got the um, my uh, uh, A10 uh, ATF 20B uh, function generator, and this is just going to be generating a one kilohertz sine wave at uh, 900 millivolts peak to peak, or 0.9 volts peak to peak. And uh, the reason why I'm using that is because that's the average, sort of the average line level uh, input. Um, so uh, that's that's what I'm using, um, just so that that way the, the preamp gets uh, a, you know, a proper level signal. Of course, if you're using a function gen, you're plugging it into something like this, um, you don't want to exceed what line level is capable of because you don't know what kind of input clamping it may have or may not have, and you don't want to blow the input because that would be bad. And uh, I'm just using my uh, super shitty um, Siglin SDS7, uh, 1072 CML scope. Um, and this is going to be uh, what we're going to be viewing the uh, the output waveform on, 
and I've got my uh, my old cell phone with my Seek Thermal camera because this is the only phone that I have that the camera app will actually work with because apparently if you update Android, their app stops working, it starts corrupting your footage, and there's nothing you can do about it because they've basically abandoned the product. So great job, Seek. Anyway, uh, the reason why I have that is because I want to show you just how fast this resistor heats up. Uh, so I've got the resistor over here, and uh, I've got the speaker wire coming from one of the channels of the amplifier. I'm only just going to do one channel for now. Uh, it's just a demo. And uh, these leads, you'll notice they're connected to themselves, and it's because I'm not using these leads to actually, um, like basically I'm not passing the current through these leads. I'm actually just using them because they've got alligator clips on the end, and I need some way to like temporarily hold the speaker wire onto these terminals. So the speaker wire connects directly to the terminals. It's not going through this loop um, because these are very low gauge wire. And of course, we're going to be pushing this thing to what is supposedly 80 watts. So I want to make sure that um, you know these don't melt. And I've got one on that side as well. Now, because this is a resistor, um, it's not a speaker. It doesn't matter um, which way you plug it in. So you could flip the wires around. That does not matter. And uh, I've just got my oscilloscope probe. Uh, it's 10x, and I've just connected it uh, one to one side, one to the other side. Now, in this case, I can connect the ground to either lead because um, it's floating. Um, the output of this amplifier is floating. Some amplifiers may not be floating, so you should always do a check between uh, the, the terminals and uh, chassis ground, like main earth ground, not the actual. Um, now, now, in this case, uh, this amplifier only has a, a two prong uh, pin, so it doesn't have a, an earth ground. So you know you're guaranteed to be safe. But if you have a grounded amplifier, which uh, I have some of those, um, you want to check that the output is not earth reference because if you plugged it in wrong, um, bye bye oscilloscope. So um, you know, make sure that you. Uh, pay attention. So um, the reason why I've got the, the thermal camera is uh, not only because I want to show you how hot this gets, but also because um, you can actually see how it's basically built internally as it gets hot. So uh, I thought that would be kind of cool. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to power it up and it's just on a CD input. And uh, in case you're wondering, I'm just using a uh, some I'm just using a BNC to uh, alligator clip lead into uh, uh, a lead which goes into the back through an adapter from uh, three and a half mil TRS into a uh, phono and that's how I'm getting the signals into this. So uh, I'll inset the uh, thermal footage now. Now uh, like I've said before I don't own a tripod for my thermal camera so sorry if the footage is a little shaky because I'm holding it with my hand while I'm attempting to focus on other stuff. So you can see right now the resistor you can still see its outline a little bit but um, it's pretty much background temperature at the moment. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to enable the output. And uh, of course, the volume is all the way down. So we're not going to see anything on the scope. So uh, let me just uh, bring you in to the uh, scope display, because this is what we're actually going to be looking at. Now, if you have a scope that has uh, measurement functionality built in, um, like this one does, um, it's super helpful, because you can just use the RMS voltage from there. And uh, you're going to, of course, want to set this to a a relatively high uh, high scale. In this case, I'm using uh, 20 volts per division. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start to increase the uh, the volume control, and you're going to start to see the one kilohertz wave appear. So we're at 1.6 volts RMS now, and uh, at this point we're not really dissipating that much power because remember that equation P equals V squared R or V squared over R. So uh, V squared gets large very, very quickly. So uh, as the voltage increases, the power is increasing uh, much faster. So we're going up. And you can now start to see a ribbing pattern appearing in the resistor. And uh, that's the actual wire that's wound around under that coating um, that's getting hot. So you can actually you can actually see uh, how dense it is. And uh, we're continuing to increase. And then you'll notice this happens. Uh, you'll notice that the waveform clips at the top and bottom. And that is uh, effectively over, it's basically exceeding the power capabilities of the amplifier. So to find the maximum power, you basically you increase the volume until it clips. And then you back it off until the point where it's just not clipping. right? 
And in this case, I'm getting an RMS voltage of 27.2 volts. So that's the number that I'm going to use to um, uh, basically base the power of this channel off of. And that resistor is getting mighty hot, so I'm just going to power that uh, down. And uh, this resistor is going to take a while to cool back down to a temperature that I can touch again. Um, of course, if I had a little fan or something, uh, even like a computer fan or something um, near it, uh, then it would be uh, much cooler, but uh, I'm just, uh, it's a quick test, so I'm not really going to bother about that. So uh, I'm just going to get a calculator and find out how much power uh, that actually was. So I've uh, just done the, uh, the calculation, and uh, with the absolute resistor value, um, we get uh, 90.2 watts. So um, for an amplifier that's rated for 80 watts per channel, it's actually overachieving a little bit. Now, there are a couple things that can accommodate for this. The first one is I only tested one channel at a time, so if I had both resistors on there, both channels loaded down, this number would most certainly be a little bit lower. How much lower, I really don't know until I, I, I test it. And uh, the second thing that can accommodate for this slightly higher power is that we're not taking into consideration distortion. Um, of course, the amplifier is specified to have a certain uh, total harmonic distortion and noise, as well as things like intermodulation distortion, all that stuff. And we're not taking any of that into account. We're just looking for clipping. Um, in order to do a proper power measurement, you need to have something that can actually uh, feed a signal in, get the uh, you know, get it amplified into a load, and then m basically measure it, the uh, the output and do a comparison in the analog domain and determine um, how much distortion there is. And you basically you crank the volume until the distortion gets out of spec, and that's the power according to spec. Um, this is a, a more crude way of doing it because, of course, I don't have that kind of equipment, but um, it's good enough. I mean, if this number was like you know, 65 watts or 70 watts or something, then I would start to suspect that maybe there's some, you know, bad capacitors or uh, resistors that are out of tolerance or, you know, something something is wrong if the number is way off what it's supposed to be. Um, and you can use that as a sort of a diagnostic tool. Or if you fix something and you want to do a stress test and ensure that everything's, everything's good, um, or do like a burn-in test uh, or whatever, um, using these power resistors is really a, a good way uh, to do that. So, um, yeah, uh, definitely, I mean, and also, of course, these can be used for a whole bunch of stuff that's not uh, amplifier-related. So um, it's always good to have just a big dummy load. Um, these are not adjustable, of course, but um, they're kind of almost indestructible. So, um, yeah, it's it's a great uh, a great great thing to have. And I chose 100 watts because most of the amplifiers I have are around 100 watts. Um, some of them are like 125 or 150 watts per channel, but these they can handle an overload for um, you know quite a while. So um, there's really no issue with getting an underrated resistor. There's no point in in my opinion to buy a bigger one. But, um, you know, you can go crazy if you want. So anyway, um, this is kind of just a ramble at this point. So hopefully this was uh, interesting and uh, maybe you uh, got something useful out of that. Anyway, until next time, thanks for watching.